Welcome back to Live Well with Aromatherapist Jerby Ko. So for today's episode, we will be learning about hypnosis and how we can use this as a tool for our well-being. J. Robert Parker is a life coach and a hypnotherapist. He owns Twin Ravens Hypnotherapy and Research LLC, and he is a member of the Hypnotherapists Union Local 472. He is a registered master hypnotist, and today he will be a guiding us through the benefits of hypnotherapy and your well-being. So before anything else, Jay Robert, would you like to give us a brief introduction about yourself? Well, uh, my name is Jay Robert Parker. I am the owner and founder of Twin Ravens Hypnotherapy and Research, LLC. And I am a hypnotherapist. I'm also a union certified master hypnotist. And that's what I do. I basically help people overcome their own thoughts and behaviors through hypnosis, using that to aid them. And one of the things I always like to stress in every show that I do is that hypnosis is a natural process. Uh, we are in hypnosis twice a day, um, 30 minutes before we go to sleep and 30 minutes after we wake up. So like when you first wake up, that kind of when you're still laying around in bed, but it's still really comfortable and your thoughts just kind of wander, that's hypnosis. That is the trance state. And that is one of the few times that your conscious and your subconscious mind talk, so to speak. And that is that, that trance state is where you can alter thoughts and behaviors that's that's why they that's the whole purpose behind like morning affirmations or nightly affirmations is you are in that trance state so you give that positive reinforcement and it becomes a subconscious suggestion wow thank you so much for that introduction because hypnosis is such a new topic for me here mm -hmm. and uh, I am not so sure, but hypnosis for most people and for what would most people would know, it may have some sort of a negative connotation, right? Yes, like the way absolutely. they play it out on, me on the media. Um, yes. And it's just very interesting to have you on board today to talk more about it, the positive side of it and how perhaps we should get to know more about it in a way that we can use it to, for our well-being. I know that you are absolutely. also a life coach. Jay, Jay Robert, would you like to um, share with us how can hypnosis benefit us? Um, well, speaking for myself personally, it completely changed my life. It's what I what I like to tell my clients is it's like there's a game being played that you don't know the rules to yet because this concept of hypnosis and suggestibility and France are all things that we deal with every day in media and in politics and religion in every aspect of human society in some way the subconscious in hypnosis is at play but we don't even know that and how can you have any hope to win at a game you don't know the rules to and once once there's this experience of what hypnosis is and what it feels like and what hypnosis isn't more importantly it becomes easier to to go through life because you recognize when it is being used for you or against you you gain the ability to filter those things out and as to what specifically hypnotherapy be, can be used to benefit that is such a broad question because it's every aspect of life. I have clients that I work with everything from uh, combat trauma to stop smoking to improving your golf game. And it's just because everything, everything about us is subconscious associations. Um, why we eat what we eat, 
why we like what we like, why we dress, why we how we dress. Like everything is a product of those years of associations, be them positive or negative. And those subconscious be- associations are what um, mandate our behavior. Like one of the, the common issues with is uh, stop smoking. And oftentimes people that come to me to top, stop smoking have tried many different ways and they always eventually go back. And the one thing that makes hypnotherapy work where other things have failed is the subconscious associations as to why you smoke in the first place are addressed because just telling you to stop smoking isn't going to last very long. I can, can I just take anyone and tell them to stop smoking and have them quit for a week? Yeah, absolutely. But for have that be lasting change, we have to figure out why you started to begin with what you associate smoking with. Uh, oftentimes one of the things I hear is people associate stress with smoking directly that if they begin to feel stress they they automatically associate that feeling with a cigarette and it could even go back further than that that let's see what's what's a good one your grandfather smoked and he died when you were very young but you always admired him and so there's a you, you have a subconscious association with smoking and that paternal authority that to you it is that connection to that person that you were connected to when you were younger or anything in between. And it's like that with everything. And one of the questions I get asked a lot is what's the difference between therapy and hypnotherapy? And it's kind of evident in the in the word it's it is therapy with hypnosis so to, to see a hypnotherapy session it looks much like a normal therapy session for the first half it's me asking you about what this issue is how it makes you feel when it started what makes it better or worse only the difference is i'm making note of the specific words and phrases and metaphors that you use the entire time to describe your issue, because that is the language of your subconscious, that that is the language that it is best to speak to your subconscious in. And, and that there's, that's kind of an information gathering phase. And then where it begins to differ is eventually you close your eyes and I walk you through the process of hypnotic induction and to see it from the outside it looks like telling stories and i don't know when they're going to be published but at some point all of my interviews are published on my website and there will be a couple of examples of me actively doing hypnosis in an interview um it's it's something I could walk up to a stranger and do on the drop of a hat. It's just kind of become an easy thing at this point. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And it's, it's, it's made the way I interact with people very interesting because for one, it's made me much more understanding because in the knowing why we think what we think and a lot of the, the subjects I was taught about, I'm able to understand people a little better. Um, I also accidentally trans cashiers and things like that or telemarketers. Um, I don't mean to, but it just happens sometimes. That's very interesting. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Wow, you've done a lot. How long have you been doing this? A year. Wow, really? Uh you can Um, you can master it in a year i was able to i i personally feel like i have a natural talent uh it's one of the only times in life i've i've felt that way it's i i tell people oftentimes of everything i've done 
this is the thing that feels like my calling. Like I, I genuinely feel like I have uh, an exceptional talent in doing this. I have seen exceptional results well past what you would think my, my lack of experience would give me. But I, I understand a lot of what's going on with us. Uh, one of my main specialties is with fear and trauma because I, I understand where we come from in our mind based on that. And one of the main points of understanding I have that viewing it through that lens is it changes everything is when we're traumatized, we are always in that moment, no matter how old we were or weren't, no matter how we were thinking, we are always, even if we are calm and logical now, that memory we have of our trauma is not calm and logical. It's from the perspective of someone that was very frightened or very young and very frightened and will always be remembered that way until you go in hypnosis and you readdress it and you are able to subconsciously reason out those things, not as a traumatized child or traumatized young adult, but as the thinking adult that you are now in a calm state. And that's, Seeing that, and as many times as I've seen it, is such a fascinating thing because it really points to so much of what we hold on to is perspective that we cling to. And I've even seen instances of people holding on to fears that weren't theirs. Like somebody else was afraid of something around them and their fear transferred to them and they carried it for 20 years until in hypnosis, they went back and re-examined that and realized that's not even my fear. I wasn't even the one that was afraid. And it's memory is such a poor thing. Uh, <laughs> and people don't realize that we don't remember things very well at all. And sometimes the way we remember things is very damaging. Reality is strictly a perception in terms of your mind is the way your mind is concerned and the terms of the way memory is concerned because all of your memories are fabricated and biased. That's why witness testimony is so bad because you could get 10 people in a room that saw one thing and get, and different Ten stories different answers yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that's I, also why hypnosis isn't admissible in court in most places because memory just isn't doesn't work that well <laughs> going back to the example that you mentioned earlier you you mentioned that you had a client who was addicted to cigarettes and you helped mm -hmm. him or her overcome it you mentioned that it I'm not so sure if this is the correct example in that case, but you mentioned that perhaps it's because of him or her having associations of cigarettes with their late grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, how do you help them move past that? Do you divert the memory? How, how do you handle that? Well, um, in that case, you take away the association with cigarettes but you have to replace it with something else. So you, in that instance, I would ask them, uh, tell me about your grandfather. What was he like? And they would eventually, they would t say something else and say he liked fishing. So instead of you associate cigarettes with your grandfather, associate fishing. And we take away this, this intrinsic positive association that you have. Because that's what it is. It's a positive association of that one aspect. Because for whatever reason, uh, that stuck out in their head. And likely it stuck out because of the smell. Smell is our most powerful sense memory. Um, it's something I use a lot, truth be told. Uh, have you ever heard of the phrase post-hypnotic suggestion? Uh, most often 
it's the cluck like a chicken thing uh, is what people associate with post-hypnotic suggestion, which cluck like a chicken is not because I cannot make anyone cluck like a chicken unless you want to, in which case that's a whole other conversation. Uh, That's scary. (laughs) Yes. But it's our, like we all have smells that take us back to our childhood. And all that is, is the power of scent association. And with what a post-hypnotic suggestion actually is, is you link a, a feeling or a thought to a word or an object, a color or a smell. And it is my belief and experience that hypnotic, uh, we call them anchors, hypnotic anchors done with scent are the most powerful because in the same way that you can smell something you associate with your childhood if i can put the link in hypnotically of say you associate the smell of jasmine with the feeling of total calm with the sensation of being anxiety free because i took you to that spot i took you to a place that was total calm and anxiety free and in that state linked that smell using hypnosis to that feeling so now even out of hypnosis when you smell that when you smell jasmine it takes you back to that calm feeling in the same way that smelling something from your childhood takes you back to that feeling of childhood wow thank you so much for that that is very uh, relevant to me because i am an aromatherapist so i am very nose driven. And I agree with you that, you know, different um, scents would trigger different memories. And the reason why I asked about the the grandfather case is because my grandfather also passed away two years ago. And there are things that makes it hard for me to move forward. (laughs) That's why I Mm -hmm. asked. Um, It it was a sad day. He he passed away very untimely. Um, Yeah, but you know, yeah, so there's a series of things that I, I can't seem to do anymore because it reminds me of that day. Yeah, so that's it. I understand <laughs> um, how, that. I understand. So how do our subconscious associations drive our behavior? For example, on a day-to-day basis, you mentioned that in a day, we are normally in hyp- hypnosis mode twice a day, right? In the morning yes. and at night. So at how least. do... Yeah, at least... And I know like when we go out, for example, when we go out, drive by a restaurant, I know there are subconscious things that play mm. there, like with the colors and et cetera. So how do, we, how do our subconscious associations drive our behavior in our normal day-to-day life? Well, um, why do you get up when you get up? Why do you do what you do when you get up? Uh, why do you drive a certain way to work every day? Why do you drive the way you drive? Why do you take care of your car the way you take care of your car? Why do you dress the way that you dress? And so on and so on and so on. And it's amazing because especially in hypnosis, even something as simple as why do you dress the way that you dress? When you ask someone subconscious that, they'll answer and you can keep following that back until like you get to the core reason that that person associates that aesthetic and that way of dress with something that they wanted to emulate and you could do that with anything really like and it all there's a there's a very scary question that i post in a lot of interviews that i do do you have free will? I think so. <laughs> yeah, that's the common one. I argue <laughs> that you don't because of that. Because everything about the way you react to a situation, to the situation themselves that you are in, are a product of your associations and your reactions and behaviors based upon those associations. And we don't have control over that. What's a food you don't like? I hate eating apples. I hate Coca Cola. <laughs> well, you should hate Coke. But why do you hate apples? Did you choose to hate apples? Mm, I think I just 
I think it's because I hated the way it it was in McDonald's apple pie. So I've yeah, you're right. I've associated you have apple negative association with that. There <laughs> and you since go. then, I hated everything apples, apple juice, even apples. I don't like it <laughs> because of a core negative association you made because of corporate branding. Mm. And this that's case in point. However, it is the very definition of free will. If you were to choose to like apples again, go inside of your head, take away those initial corporate associations, and then view it from a fresh light. And in fact, like it, if that is what you so choose to do. And that is kind of what I offer, that the way that we feel about things is not the way we choose to feel about things. It is simply a reaction. And what if you could feel the way you wanted to feel about things? What if you could think the way that you wanted to think? And because right now, okay, so you've told me that you have an association with McDonald's and apples. So stop. Just stop. You can't. Because you cannot consciously affect change on the subconscious. However, if we take down something called the critical filter, which is the, the barrier between those two parts of your mind, then we can speak directly to your subconscious and compartmentalize that hatred of McDonald's, justified as it, should is, as it really is, <laughs> and separate that from apples and because ultimately in the end logically why are those things associated it's not logical mm -hmm. even though the association is very powerful think about branding corporate logos and things like that you see that gold m and you automatically have good or bad all of these associations that the symbol itself as simple as it is makes all of these things come forward in your mind but in the same way that this system is used against you every day you can use it for you because you can make your own symbols and anchors and you can program your own mind to have your own associations so it doesn't matter what the corporate logo is trying to make you think if you have your own symbol that subconsciously you know means this set of positive things, then that same strength of association that that corporation uses to make you associate that symbol with its products, you can have your own symbol that makes you associate that symbol with your well-being. And it works incredibly effectively. And the illustration of how effectively it works is in corporate branding. It's, it's in that association and how powerful it is for a lot of people in a lot of places. Um, and there's no reason that's part of the game that I mentioned earlier, that if you don't know the rules to the game, that's, that's it right there, that the brand association, that's just one aspect. You don't know that you're being manipulated into associating a hamburger with this meaningless letter and that there is a large set of the population that that association makes them end up at a McDonald's and it's ever it is the very purpose of logos is that association even if you take a marketing class it will tell you to associate your brand with whatever and we don't know that that's a subconscious thing. We just think that, oh, it's just a brand logo. It's just a little picture they use as a bookmark. No, oh, even as something as innocent as a logo is a subconscious trick. And once you know it, once you realize it and you see it for what it is and you've used this system to your benefit, it stops having as much of an effect on you. And it's, like I, I tell all of my clients, stop watching commercials because commercials are 
specifically designed to drill into your subconscious. Um, every person in America can spell the word baloney because of a commercial that ran for about 20 years ran by the Oscar Mayer Corporation where they spell out in a jingle the word baloney. And because <laughs> of that, everyone can spell that word. And that's because I, I, I tell this to people and that it sounds scary because all corporations and all these different systems are trying to play mind games with you. And they are. But that's just what it is. It's a game. And just like I called it a game the first time, once you know the rules, it's way easier to play. Because once, you, once you're aware of a danger, it becomes easier to avoid it. So until you're aware that there even is a danger, you can't avoid it. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Uh, um, is there a chance for me to be aware when I am hypnotized? Like you, you are a master in this. Are you aware in times that you are quote and unquote oh, yeah. hypnotized? Absolutely. Uh, you will willfully do it sometimes. So do you read? Do you, and like, do you really get it? Can you see what you read? And do you get involved and emotionally invested in what you read? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, why? What's causing that? Because um, that's not real. You're reading well, something on, you're reading words on paper. That's right. But most of the things I'm reading is because of aromatherapy. So I try to absorb them as much as I can. Not really about, I don't know. I mean, okay. if you're reading then, nonfiction. Then let's, use, then let's use another example then. Okay. Movies. Have you ever mm -hmm. watched a movie that you get emotionally involved in? Sometimes. Why? Especially it's when I see myself in the character. Exactly. And it is hypnosis. That's that theta state of trance that makes you go along with that journey. Oh. So you, you can willfully enter it. And the best way to prevent yourself from doing it is something called mindfulness, which mm. that is... That is part of learning hypnosis uh, or, or being hypnotized is you start to learn that state and you learn when you're going into that state and the things that will specifically cause you to. And if you ever find yourself to where you're having a hard time paying attention to something or you are very involved in something, like you're hyper focused, be it on a thought or on a uh, outside thing it's because of hyper suggestibility and the easiest way to get out of that is to be aware of it and to consciously take an assessment of yourself to, to breathe in notice your surroundings become more consciously aware of things uh talking is another good way to do it because talking is strictly a function of your higher mind uh its communication is not a subconscious thing so by by speaking you have to be out of hypnosis that's why in hypnosis i tend not to ask people questions or if i do i tell you nod your head or shake your head and because i don't want you utilizing that higher conscious process because I'll have to ease you back down into hypnosis a little bit because you will have inevitably brought yourself up. So even if it's just talking to yourself or even if it's, it's anything that you need to be consciously aware of, that you utilize your logic, that you utilize your willpower, uh, things that you have to be present for, kind of focus in on those. Um, and if, if it's a client that I work with, because some people are naturally more susceptible to that, just slipping into hypnosis on a day to day. Uh, those people, by the way, are the reason stage hypnosis exists. Uh, stage hypnosis is real most of the time. 
the the skill is in finding those hypnotically suggestible people in the audience it's actually pretty easy but for them what i'll do is like that anchor that i mentioned before mm -hmm. uh, i will take them into hypnosis and then i will take them out of hypnosis and then i will give them the anchor consciously so it's kind of working in reverse that now you have this scent anchor or this object that you have that you associate with focus that you associate with being out of the trance state and one of the interesting things because i know even in this day and age there's still people that don't know if hypnosis is real or not uh it can be monitored scientifically i can tell you exactly what happens to your body and your brain as you undergo hypnosis because i've seen it while hooked up to different monitoring devices when you are in hypnosis there is a change to your heartbeat there is a change to your skin reactivity there is a change in the waves in your brain that the theta waves in your brain become more active and there's all manner of monitorable replicatable physiological changes so this is before we even get to the massive stack of medical research that exists uh which is in my opinion my my most useful tool when it comes to hypnosis because if someone um gets a hold of me and they ask me something like say can hypnosis help with infertility is or fertility treatment um i will say yes and here are three or four studies that reinforce that that were actually carried out by medical institutions using hypnosis as an adjunct to that treatment so i don't expect people to just take my word for it i like to provide the actual written scientific evidence behind everything that i say because there is scientific written evidence behind everything that i say um and it's it's very important that that people understand that hypnosis is not like a metaphysical process necessarily it's a a guidance of a totally natural uh monitorable thing like you can you can see it you can see its effects you can see it and one of the most fascinating things was when i first started school because i attended a college that specializes in hypnotherapy it's one of the only ones that's accredited in my country mm -hmm. and in that it's this 720 hour program with an internship and previous to doing that i had very minimal experience with hypnosis i wasn't 100% sure it was real because i'd never i never experienced it personally i'd never seen anyone be what i know to be hypnotized i'd seen stuff in the media and on tv things like that of course like everyone has what that gives you doubts because of a lot of what you see but the first time i saw someone get hypnotized it was profound because there's physiological reactions that cannot be faked that happen the first time i saw someone raise their arm up off a table and they did not consciously do it the first time i had somebody make me raise my arm off a table without consciously doing it it was fascinating to me because why why does this system exist within our head that allows us to do this has it always existed is this a new development like there's there's arguments for all of them because we have no way of knowing really um and even to this day i cannot answer the question why does this thing exist like why do we have this feature of our brain there's theory out there there's theory that this is an evolution that uh just like i told you 
we don't have free will, but we can choose to have free will, that there's people that think that's new, that all throughout human history, we've all we've been going on association. But now we have this tool that our brain has involved, evolved that lets us do something called meta programming, which is consci consciously altering our thoughts and behaviors that we we can now act and think the way we want to act and think. Because does a person with anxiety want that? Does a person with depression want that? No. But if you could choose to take that away, wouldn't you? So there is, and that's not to say that all you need to treat depression is hypnosis, but so much can be done. Hypnosis, in addition to pretty much everything, helps. Hypnosis is used oftentimes with cancer treatment because oh. relieving the anxiety and relieving the, the stress over treatment and increasing the mind-body connection to accept that treatment, it benefits that treatment so much. And because everything we've always heard that oh it's all in your head it really is everything is all in your head and the way you choose to go into a situation really affects that and how would you rather be if god forbid you were receiving cancer treatment do you want to be scared do you want to be unsure or do you want to be calm and you want to have a set of tools to allow you to maintain that calm so that you can more readily heal. Stress is the biggest killer we face on a day-to-day -day basis. But why? And why do we hold on to it? And a lot of those things are difficult to answer. But if we could let it go, why not make the choice to let it go? And that's, that's why I do these interviews. And that's why I kind of, I make a, I make a big point to put myself out there to, to answer these questions and to say these things, because we, we possess the ability to think better, to, to make the choice to, to live a better life. We just have to undergo this process. We have to learn it's, it's like having a function of our body. It's like someone ta never taught you how to breathe and or what breathing is or why it's important because it's still a thing that you do regardless of you knowing about it or not. But knowing about this process in your brain and this whole other system that requires care and attention just like every other part of your body, by knowing that you're able to be healthier it's that game I keep referencing. By knowing the game that is being played, you know what you need to personally do to make yourself better, to make yourself happier, or however you choose to feel. And that's what I really have to stress, is I can allow people to feel the way they choose to feel. And it's authentic. It's not a, a fake thing. It is actually, if you want to feel happier, if you want to be more positive, I can authentically help you feel more positive. Even if there's things in your life that are making that positivity difficult, we can still reframe those difficulties to make them not be so toxic to your thought process. Because again, it's all in your head. Everything is all in your head. And that's not to say that it doesn't matter. That is just to say that each of us only lives in ourselves and in our own head. As, as much as we want to, to be a society and to interact with others, in the end, it's just us. And the only thing we have direct control over is that, ourselves. So why not take that control over your thoughts as well? Because as you said, you, you don't choose to keep disliking apples. It's just that association so deep. 
that it's now become an unquestioned thing. Anything that looks like an apple, smells like an apple, tastes like an apple, all has that eventual association. And like I said, stop. Because there's no reason to dislike a healthy food. None at all. So choose to stop. But that's not a thing. That's not something we could choose to do in, until this. Until we now have this choice. People don't want to keep smoking. And that's understandable. So now make that choice. Actively program that behavior. Because I, I could not hypnotize somebody to do anything they wouldn't normally do. Um, a, an example of that would be, say, it's gruesome, but your average person wouldn't, wouldn't pick up a gun and shoot someone. And I could not hypnotize them into picking up that gun and shooting somebody because that's not something they would morally do within their framework. Now, however, if that person was hypnotized to think that that was a squirt gun and that it would be so funny if they shot that person in the face because that person loves pranks so much, then the associations are different and the outcome is very different. And a lot of my colleagues like to say that you can hypnosis is harmless, but it's not. Because mm. you see it at play with corporate corporations. You see it at play with advertisements and with the media. You see all of these things where your associations are specifically altered or the mental state you are in is taken advantage of. And I was asked a very interesting question the other day. And that's what's the difference between hypnosis and manipulation. Mm. And the difference is manipulation is somebody else doing it. Hypnosis is you doing it. Because all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. I'm just the guide. That's, that's why I say we are in trance state at least twice a day. Our body naturally goes into this state. I simply know how to speak the language of your subconscious to guide this state to whatever you want it to be. And that's, that's really the difference. Hypnosis can be used to manipulate, as you see with advertisement and with media and things like that. But it is once you are in the hypnotic state, choosing to to think a certain way that's that is manipulation by its very definition but instead of manipulating yourself into buying this product or thinking a certain way you're manipulating yourself to eat healthier or think more positively about yourself or be more motivated or be less scared and that's that's positive it's like everything else in life. Everything is a double-edged sword, it seems like today. But if once you, once you know what hypnosis can do, so many of my clients tell me that they view the world differently. And I believe that because I myself view the world differently than I did before I learned all of these things. And if... If I could teach the whole world about this, I absolutely would because what it, it's to me, it's no different than never knowing what your lungs were, never knowing why you had to breathe or what the process of breathing was or anything like that. It's we're literally, we are all blind, but have the ability to see basically. We just don't know we have those kinds of eyes. And once you are opened up to this whole new interpretation of the world, this whole new way to view mental health and to view your own wellness and the way that you think, 
life becomes a little different because if you didn't know, look at what happened way back in the day when people didn't know about that breathing in black coal smoke was bad for you. They didn't know that. So they would breathe in black coal smoke and not know why they got sick and died. It's the same thing. Until you know that something's dangerous, you can't avoid it. And it's in, in the same way that us eventually learning that coal was toxic and you can't breathe in its fumes. There's this whole part of our brain that we have to learn about. This whole system at play that's used to manipulate us every single day. But we don't know. And we know we're being manipulated a lot of times, but we don't know the exact process of why we're manipulated, how we're manipulated. So if we do, if we know what that process is, then it's no longer a threat. Then we can defend ourselves against it and we could use that same process to live a better life. That's right. You know what? I've never personally seen anyone who's hypnotized like in front of me. I've heard stories, but it's not always on a positive note. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I've only had a few brushes with hypnotherapy. I, I know someone who does hypnobirthing and she tells me that hypnosis has helped women become less anxious in giving birth. So it's really uh, um, wonderful. And just a few hours ago, before our interview, I've come across this article about using hypnotherapy with gut health. So like mm -hmm. you were mentioning different benefits of using hypnosis and <laughs> hypnotherapy. That's very refreshing to me because um, the way lay people like me would know about hypnosis is, you know, someone manipulating someone using a pendulum of some sort and then putting them in trance correct <laughs> and then snapping their fingers to break them out of it <laughs> do you still do that or is this just a very um, unrealistic I, misconception some of us snap some of us don't uh <laughs> i there are ways for me to use a pocket watch um but i could hypnotize you with a hot dog <laughs> it doesn't matter uh, wow <laughs> it just the whole idea is it's a, it's a thing to fixate someone's eye on. Um, it, so it doesn't matter what it is. It can be my fingers. It could be your own fingers. Uh, a pocket watch is useful because there's a ticking noise associated, associated with it that's helpful. Um, but that's not the only way to induce hypnosis. There's many different ways. I, I said on average, how long does it take me to hypnotize somebody? Two, three minutes. Like, oh. <laughs> it, it Even varies. strangers? You can yeah, do Yeah, I can walk up to someone on the street. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. I Even might have through to ask the them screen? a couple. Right yeah, now? I work remotely. Wow. I work remotely. Hmm. Like, I see clients all over the world. Um, that's one of the benefits that COVID kind of brought to our industry is no one had really asked the question before if hypnosis can be done from a distance because we've, we've never really had a reason to. Uh, so there was a lot of exploration as to if Zoom was a viable alternative. And it turns out it is that, of course, there's some things that we can't do and it's it's nice to be in person because you notice the little movements and things a little better but after i've worked with somebody enough i don't even need the video i can just oh. call them and it's well because eventually you again through our associations you associate my voice with the hypnotic state and so i've I've got clients that I've worked with like over a dozen times that it's almost hard to talk to them because I have to like keep them out of trance because their brain just naturally <laughs> hears my voice and just checks out like oh, it's time, um, <laughs> which is useful.
because anything I say to that person practically, their subconscious hears. So after a while, it really does get so easy. Like I can slip suggestions in conversations to somebody that's hypnotically suggestible to me already. I can tell them like, you're going to feel better today and you're going to do better on that test because of the way you feel or whatever have you. And that, that word, those words are spoken directly to their subconscious already. So even just by me saying that, they're going to do that. A good example is, um, why do you do what your parents say? Because of the association. And even now, if you hear one of your parents' voices, there's that, that response because that association is so deeply conditioned because of the parental influence. If you have a boss, you associate their voice with all of the things with that. And in that same way, my clients will begin to associate my voice with that state, with the hypnotic state. And their subconscious knows, oh, it's this, it's time to go here. Um, if I had a physical office, there would be association to that as well. That the second a client lays down on my chair, they're already out because they know subconsciously what time it is. Um, and this is that same process that we can use to our advantage. Like you have songs that make you feel certain ways. Why? You have songs with negative associations because of what happened in your life at that time. You have songs with positive associations for that same reason. And why are you just letting associations happen out of your control? Why not take full control over that and decide that you want a song to be associated with a person or a state or a memory or a smell? Or any of these things we can choose how to interpret our environment absolutely um i like i said i work with a lot of fear and so much of that is is perception i had a fear of spiders for a long long time until just for fun i had one of my peers just take that away and now I'm not afraid of spiders. I don't particularly care for them, but I can look at one without freezing on the spot, which was more than I got before. Wow. So can I deploy hypnosis on myself or do I always need someone to do it for me? <laughs> no. Uh, Self-hypnosis is absolutely a thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the best way to learn self-hypnosis is for a hypnotist to guide you through that process and give you those anchors. Um, but as to going into the state, it's actually very easy. Uh, one of the easiest ways I can suggest, and of course people are going to say after I suggest this, that that sounds a lot like meditation and yeah, there's a reason. Uh, it's called uh, synchronistic breathing. And what it is, is you breathe in through your nose for a count of four. And you breathe out through your mouth for a count of four. And you maintain that rhythm. And you focus on maintaining that rhythm that each breath in lasts as long as the breath out and the one before it. And as you do that, you enter into something called synchronous alpha, which actually is... It, it, it affects your brain waves. And as you focus on that calm, you're able to go more into that state. One of the things that I do personally, and for, for me, this works very well. I've not tested this on other people, but I suspect this is a universal thing. I find something that makes me feel nostalgic. Uh, a memory, an image, a smell. And I focus on that while I do that breathing. And that, that looking back, that subconscious looking back kind of propels me into that state. And I recommend that it, for the first few times, 
uh, or at least the first time that it be done on a one-on-one -on -one basis with someone else. Because depending on what your suggestibility is, uh, hypnosis can feel a little scary at first. Uh, if you don't know, if you're not guided, like what I mean by that is there was something I had to get over, um, because of my suggestibility and that for a long time when I was going into hypnosis, I caught myself because like there was this feeling of like drifting down and I caught myself and would always pull myself up a little bit and had to be brought back down. And it was learning to be comfortable with with that sensation of letting go and that again is because of my because of my suggestibility but it's it's easier whenever you have a good professional hypnotist with you guiding the process and letting you go back there on your own um there are, and i mentioned the meditation thing uh, the question comes up quite often what's the difference between meditation and hypnosis um not much uh the the best way to explain it is if meditation is taking a swim around the pool hypnosis is diving right in the deep end and getting out so you you're kind of in the same body of water it's just with hypnosis compared to most meditation you go much deeper into that state uh hypnosis on a day-to-day -day basis reaches the same levels of consciousness as things like transcendental meditation uh a types of meditation that can take years and years to learn i can induce within five ten minutes with hypnosis just by wow. getting you down to that level and it's the same brain waves. It's the same monitor monitorable thing that's happening. It's just those years spent learning with transcendental meditation are learning how to take yourself to that level. Whereas opposed to a professional with intimate knowledge of the mind and of the subconscious can take you right there and get you to that same level. And that's that's kind of the benefit of it and it's i i realized that pretty quickly because i'm so bad at meditation it's not even funny <laughs> um but i self-hypnotize very well and that's a lot of that is who i am uh i was an only child so i spent a lot of time staring at walls as a child oh. <laughs> and i i learned how to get into that state and it wasn't until I learned how to hypnotize and I was hypnotized myself that I realized, man, I was a weird kid. I just spent all this time in my room putting myself in trance because children naturally go into that state much easier. It's harder for them to stay in that state, but they'll get there a drop of a hat. Um, and it's, and it's funny as you, as you learn, as you experience what trance is like, you start to realize how often you're in it and how often you've been in it and the times in your life that you look back that you're like, oh, wow, yeah, I was 100% gone. Like, uh, an interesting example of trance in daily life. Uh, do you drive? Not really. <laughs> Me Not and really. Rios, we don't go together. <laughs> understandable okay well have you ever been walking and you miss your turn for where you were supposed to go and you didn't even realize it mm -hmm. why what, what where was your head you know what sometimes i mean this is true for most human we go on autopilot <laughs> right there are times and what, we do that <laughs> what is what is that autopilot we call it autopilot <laughs> that's not accurately what it is oh. trance it's oh. that trance state it's, it's why you were just focused on your mind so much that you just went right past where you were supposed to go. And that same, it's, it's like a focus almost, but instead of focusing on a part of your body or on something externally, 
you're focused in your head and that's why movies work that's why novels can take people in that's why all of our fantasy even exists is to make us feel a certain way everything about our individual cultures is made to feel make us feel a certain way that's why there's art and music and other aspects of a culture directly and intrinsically associated with it for that subconscious association with whatever that thing may be and it's just another example of how this system is just at play everywhere at all times and you, you should, if, if there is so much of a game being played you really need to know how that game's being played <laughs> yeah i think so too and i was wondering you mentioned about suggestibility um so it means that there are people who are easier to get hypnotized and then there are people who are not, not necessarily so? mm -hmm. it doesn't have to do with difficulty when i say that it has to do with quite literally the way i speak to someone um mm -hmm. and there's a it's called the ENP system. It's, a, it's special to the type of hypnosis that I do. And I have everyone, before they work with me, take a test generally, unless it's on the spot, and obviously I can't. But I generally at this point kind of know where someone falls on that scale just by talking to them a little bit. But what it says is basically like, do I need to speak to you literally? Do I need to tell you things like your eyes are getting heavy? you feel this certain way or do i need to be inferential do i need to say things like you may begin to feel your eyes getting heavy if you so choose you can let them close whenever you want and that's really the the main marked difference is how do you speak to somebody and that's what i mean about how this changed the way i view the world because you, we speak differently we have to be spoken to differently and until we know what those different types of people are that's why we have such a hard time communicating because if you don't know this person needs to be spoken to literally and you're going on with these metaphors and analogies and you're trying to make this big vague point yeah they're gonna hate it like you're, you're not gonna be able to communicate with them very well but if you recognize that this person is that suggestibility type, you know that everything you say to them is going to need to be very direct, very to the point, and your communication is going to be better for that. And it's, it's just learning this system of how we all work. And this is a thing that I teach my clients um, as part of their own suggestibility as, where, as well as what other people's suggestibility means because you need to know about other people and in that knowledge like learning about my personal suggestibility type did so much to, to go towards the way i felt about myself and how much i liked myself even because like i often say life doesn't come with a user manual necessarily we don't know if our thoughts are normal or not we don't know if things going on in our head or our body are normal because we don't really have that that any resource to tell us that but to hear that oh this suggestibility type thinks this certain way it acts this certain way around people like to hear yourself described in this this defined thing and have it all be things which you previously were unsure about yourself with that you didn't know if that was normal you thought that oh, maybe this is strange that i don't like to be around people or that i think this certain way and then come to learn that no that's just how people that are your suggestibility type are and that it's not unusual and that if you want to work around that this is how and this is how you you speak to people like this and this is how they'll speak to you and knowing how we communicate 
is half of hypnosis and knowing how to communicate with somebody because for hypnosis there has to be a, a, a kind of trust and that your subconscious has to be confident in the idea that I or whoever it may be is someone that knows what they're talking about it that, that has that knowledge and it, if you think about it it's something we go through on a day-to-day -day basis if someone walks up to you with a white lab coat and a clipboard what do you assume you assume they have authority you assume they are something different or than you are that you need to listen to why again association you associate the white lab coat with a position of trust. Um, and it's, I, I could sit here all day and, and take every single thing that we deal with on a day to day basis and just run it backward until we get to that core association of why we even do that or why we think the way we do. <laughs> Yeah, actually, when you were mentioning about the lab coat, I was thinking of this really popular beauty brand who lets their sales staff wear lab coats so that they look more professional. So you are very spot on on that in case our uh -huh. audience haven't realized that. I'm glad Jay Roberts just said, laid it out for yeah. us. <laughs> they co-opted that association of trust with the lab coat and made their employees wear it. That person wearing that isn't a scientist. They don't have any type of trust, but you <laughs> subconsciously associate the garment with trust. And that's, that's just societal. That's, I, I want to say normal, but it's not necessarily normal. It's just what the association has become. And again, that's not an association you controlled. That was just something you learned. So why not start learning your associations on purpose? Why not start choosing the way that you want to think, which is what I offer. Wow. So Jay Roberts, for our final question, what is different about your hypnotic technique? You mentioned earlier you let your clients answer a form. Um, um, could you please expand so on that? There are different schools of hypnosis, both literally and metaphorically. And the, the both literal and metaphorical school that I come from has a system that its founder made that it's called the ENP system. It ranks us all on an emotional to physical scale in terms of suggestibility and also in terms of behavior. And it's just a basic test that I have people take to give me an idea of where they stay uh through interactions with people i flipped flipped it around because it got it backwards but it gives it's what gives me the initial idea of the way i need to speak to your subconscious the way that i need to induce your hypnosis um and the the specific school that i mentioned is called uh capacinian and that tends to be a little more structured uh, it tends to be based a little more on authority, but that's not really the school that I apply. Um, in practice, I structure my sessions like a Capucinian hypnosis in that it's very laid out. But in terms of technique, I'm something called Ericksonian, which is based around this man named Milton Erickson. And he was very conversational he uh it was not based on authority with him it was based upon um a trust and an assumption of that trust it's it quite literally boils down to the same the authority of police versus the authority of a father and one is the authority that you follow because you believe you have no choice the other one is the one you follow because you believe it's the right choice. And that's what Ericksonian hypnosis is. Um, it can sometimes look like conversation, like a back and forth. Um, sometimes it's just telling stories and in those stories relating, it's 
It's like telling fairy tales to someone's subconscious because all fairy tales have a purpose. They have a meaning behind the story. That's the purpose of folklore. All folklore teaches something, some intrinsic lesson in society. And we hear that and that's neat. But if your subconscious hears that, it, it understands inherently that lesson. Um, so sometimes Ericksonian hypnosis just looks like quite literally me telling you a fairy tale. One of my favorite things to use um, for clients I've had that have dealt with a lot of abuse in their life, uh, specifically in relationships, is I'll tell them the story of the frog and the scorpion. Uh, have you ever heard that? No, no not really. <laughs> so it's, it's very old. There's a lot of places that contest where it comes from. But basically what it says is there is a river. And on the edge of a river, there is a frog. And he's getting ready to cross. And up to him walks a scorpion and asks him for a ride. And the frog looks at the scorpion and says, no, you're a scorpion. You'll sting me. And the scorpion says, I know, but trust me. And so the frog begins to think about it and thinks what harm can be done. So knowing the scorpion's a scorpion, he lets this insect on his back and they get halfway across the river and the scorpion stings the frog. And as they're both drowning, the frog turns to the scorpion and says, now we're both going to die. Why'd you do that? And the scorpion says, because I'm a scorpion. Mm -hmm. And by... By conveying that that message, however roundabout it may be, of people tell you who they are. You know who people are. You just choose to ignore it for your own benefit, however you view it. And that a scorpion will tell you that it's a scorpion. Or you'll know a scorpion for its stinger and its claws or whatever red flags that you know to ignore. But you don't. And then you wonder why halfway across the river you end up stung when it's because you knew that was a scorpion the entire time. And in a way, that's almost not the one to blame because you knew this person was evil or bad, but you chose to ignore it. One of my favorite things to tell people is when you wear rose colored glasses, all the red flags just look like flags. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I'm not wearing rose colored glasses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jay Roberts, thank you so much for that. Very insightful Very session. How can our audience find you? Please. Um, Absolutely. Share with us. Uh, well, first of all, as I said, I'm fully remote. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, we can work out a way to work together. Uh, the easiest way to get a hold of me is from my website at www.twinravens.org. You can also get a hold of me through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. All those are just under Twin Ravens Hypno. Or you could just email me directly at jrobertparker at protonmail.com. That's it. If you have any questions, if you want to talk about becoming a client, any of that, I'd be happy to answer absolutely any questions anyone has. Thank you so much for that. I will put all J. Roberts' email and details here on my post. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I'll see you on my next episode. Bye. Thanks for having me.